Welcome to worship today. The comeback has started. If you agree with that, say, oh, yeah. That's what I wanted to hear. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship this morning. And again, I'm happy to see. I know folks are still coming in. And uh, <clears throat> this is just wonderful to see everybody and uh, to be able on a beautiful Sunday to worship God. Back on Easter Sunday, we did this. And I said, here's the thing. Let's do this again. Let's do this again before we open up uh, the doors for in-person worship. And uh, here we are. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, I got to tell you something. It is great to talk to people instead of an empty room. It is uh, wonderful. That's why I was wandering around out there like, uh, I guess it's time to start. I think I'd rather just visit with everybody. But here we are. It is uh, great to be here and to remember that we are still the church. We are still the church and we are gathered and we are connected. Even if you're in your living room or your kitchen or out on your deck or you're in a lawn chair or you're in your car right now, we are the church and we have been gathered and we have come together because of our desire to know God more and because of our desire uh, to uh, connect to other people. Uh, we have been through a lot in 11 weeks. Every single person tuned in today or here today, we have been through it for 11 weeks. If you agree with that, say yeah. Uh-huh. But the sun is shining, and as I already said in that, uh, it's a video, the comeback and the resurgence has started. We are here today connected through the power of the Holy Spirit that has always brought God's people together. The Holy Spirit has always brought God's people together, whether it's uh, separated by, by six feet or by blocks or by miles. And that's what we want to remember today is that we are connected today as God's people. Once again, turning our faces to God, turning our eyes to God, giving our prayers to God, bringing ourselves to God, along with our hopes and our desires to live differently. You know, not only have we been through it in the last 11 weeks, but yesterday, uh, after the week we just had, <clears throat> it reminded me that it is like our world is even more on fire, right? Uh, some of the things that are going on around the United St States are just mind-blowing, sad, tragic. Our world's on fire, and it's the wrong kind of fire. Our world's on fire with all the, the division and the violence and the hatred and the lawlessness and the selfishness and the fear and fear and fear. It's on fire. But today, church, today, we come together to remember God's holy fire. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day that we celebrate when God's breath breathed into existence, God's instrument, God's tool, God's means and methods to save the world, and that is the church. That is the church gathered. Today is Pentecost, and it's the day that we're going to, uh, in the midst of all the, 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 the um, bad fire, our world's on fire with all the things I just mentioned, we remember God's holy fire. We're going to remember God's Holy Spirit power and fire as we go through this worship celebration. I'm going to read uh, some of this from Acts. And if you've got your Bibles with you on your phone, on your laptop, at your house, in your car, you can follow along. Many of you know these words. They're familiar. You see, Jesus, in the first part of the book of Acts, had told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait, and they would receive power. And so when the day came, Pentecost is a big festival in Jerusalem of the harvest and the first fruits and this kind of thing. And there were people from all over gathered. And it says suddenly when all the, 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 the they were all together, like 120 of Jesus' followers, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem many God-fearing people, Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, when they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each of them heard, uh, heard speaking in their own language. And they were utterly amazed. And they said, aren't these guys that are talking like Galileans? which meant like, you know, the deplorables, like the uncouth, like the, 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 uh, the dregs, right? Galileans, they can barely put two sentences together, okay? Aren't these Galileans? And then they said, but we hear, our, uh, uh, the, the, uh, we hear them speak in our own tongue. And amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? And some, however, made fun of them and said, 
they've had too much wine. And, of course, we know the famous response to that. Peter said, they haven't had too much wine. It's only 10 o'clock. <laughs> if it was two, but no. <laughs> the story goes on, folks, about the power of God's Holy Spirit to ignite something, God's breath from heaven. And it really was like a breath, a wind blowing over some coals. Picture that in your mind. Some coals that have been banked up, right? Um, and they're just waiting for some fresh logs to be put on there. And suddenly a breath comes, a wind comes, and it ignites those coals that are already hot, that are just there waiting. And that's a way to understand Pentecost and what happened, is that the disciples... And after the crucifixion and after the resurrection and after the ascension, we're just kind of hanging out. But they weren't, the fire hadn't gone out. They were hot coals ready to go. And the new logs were all those people in Jerusalem. And so God breathed that Holy Spirit, that holy fire into those men and women. And if he had not, we wouldn't be here today. They experienced, those 120 followers, experienced a resurgence. And that's a word that you're going to hear a lot today. Uh, because to me, it's a powerful word, a resurgence. Uh, to define that, and I can't see my iPad up here, Chad, so I'll let you for the folks at home flip slides. Um, so a resurgence is an increase or a revival after a period of little activity. It is a rising again into life and activity. That's what a resurgence is. And those first 120, they're the ones that set that example of a resurgence, of coming to life after little activity. And man, isn't that word applicable to all of us today? After 11 weeks of changed activities, after 11 weeks of everybody's life being impacted, there has been changed activity. There has been little activity, um, uh, like compared to our usual activities, but we stay, we stay connected to those original followers and invite God's Holy Spirit to be breathed upon us once again into each of us and to all of us collectively on this Pentecost Sunday and going forward. Again, this is why that word and that concept and that idea of resurgence is so powerful to me. It's why we put it on T-shirts. It's why um, it's on the video. Is It's a powerful pointing to the power of God to revive us. Not just to go back to our crazy 100 mile an hour activities, folks. You with me on that? Say yes. It's not that. But it is about living. And it is about a revival and a resurgence of faith and of trust in God. That's what I'm talking about. It's a resurgence in the desire to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. It's a resurgence in the desire to be more deeply connected to other followers of Jesus Christ, what we think of as a Christian community. And so I'll say again, I'm glad that you're a part of this today. Each and every one of you, those at home, those on this stage, those that were in here at 6.30 this morning, setting all this stuff up, I am, I am deeply grateful for that. And I also hope that you will continue to be part of this Christian community. And even if you're watching remotely, that you continue to be part of Grandview. We've been through a lot this 11, we 11 weeks, but man, God has done some amazing things in the midst of God's people that have hung in and not give up. If you agree with that, shout amen. Uh -huh. Or you could even honk your horn if you wanted to, Larry Burquist, right? Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The rest of the story in Acts. Um, so these 120 followers of Jesus are just like totally on fire in a holy fire in a good way, and uh, especially Peter. And so after, after the, they say to Peter, and if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. I'm going to tell you this story. My sunglasses don't have a bifocal in them. That's the real reason I'm not going to read it anymore. So um, basically is, it, is that the people in Jerusalem said, what is going on? What's this all about? And Peter, Peter, the one that had denied Jesus earlier, had this boldness, and he got up and he began to preach. And he began to tell everybody that could listen about what happened about Jesus and how, how he'd been put to death and, and resurrected and why God did it and, and that, that it fulfilled Scripture. Remember, he was talking to Jewish people. This was important. It was deeply connected with the, what we think of as the Old Testament. And, and Peter preached boldly. And then the people that were listening, it says they were cut to the heart, right? They were convicted. They were moved. And it says that 3,000 were converted that day. 3,000 wanted to be baptized and to believe and to follow 
this new way of Jesus. It was a powerful happening on Pentecost. And you can keep reading in the book of Acts, which we all have been, um, and, and you see that there continues to be these powerful events that happen in the book of Acts. You know, it says, uh, you know, the, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, it should really be entitled the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because as you read through Acts, you see over and over and over what God is doing through people. The Holy Spirit is doing through people. Um, you know, I, I was reminded yesterday, I was pulling some notes together for this, and I was reminded of that true story that Alfred Nobel, he's the guy that uh, uh, he invented this explosive element, right? And then, then years later, he felt so bad for uh, inventing something that destroyed so many things. Uh, he, he came up with the Nobel Peace Prize, right? So interesting guy. When he invented this explosive element that was stronger than anything at the time, he had a friend that, 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 that was a Greek scholar, and uh, he said, I need to name this something. And so the Greek friend says, uh, dunamis, dunamis is the name that Nobel gave to the invention of dynamite. How many of you knew that? Did you know that story? Dunamis is a Greek word. This is the word that Jesus used in the first part of Acts when Jesus, before he ascended, when he said to his followers, go to Jerusalem and wait, you will receive dunamis. You will receive an explosive, powerful thing, is the word Jesus used. And again, that's what we see all through the book of Acts. You shall receive explosive dynamite power when you receive the Holy Spirit. And again, that's one act after another. The church, after the day of Pentecost, the church, God's church, exploded, right, in the world exploded in a good way, in a positive way, exploded into the world. And absolutely, we need to remember this sometimes, that the church, God's church, God's instrument to save and redeem the world, absolutely positively changed this world, human, humankind, humanity, in deep and profound ways. It was a church that led in so many areas and gave us things, gave the world things like human dignity, and, and rights, and democracy, and politics even, and the rule of law, and health, and hospitals, and welfare, and education. It was a church, God's church, this instrument that did these things that changed this world in profound and deep, deep ways. The language arts, and arts, and arch architecture, and uh, morals, and a moral code. You start to think about that the way, when I say the church exploded, it absolutely positively did. And on Pentecost Sunday, it's good to remember that. And it's also good to remember and think about it in our current context. And so in the last 50 years, I realize that we've seen what, well, at least seems to me, we seem, it seems like we've seen a decline. We've seen a decline in the church. And I don't just mean numbers. I was thinking about that yesterday, about how in the last 50 years, we've seen a decline in the church's voice in the world. We've seen a decline, certainly in North America. Let me clarify that. Because the church is still powerfully exploding in places like Nigeria and in Africa and, and in parts of Asia. But in North America, the church, this explosive thing, this, this instrument that God has used uh, for thousands of years to change the world, declined. A decline in our voice, a decline in our our influence of the church in uh, culture and society. In the last 50 years, there also has been that decline numerically in all the mainline or old line churches, the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians and Lutherans and so forth. But it's a other kind of divine decline that, 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 that's on my mind. It's a, again, you, you understand, that to go from to go from uh, God's instrument to change and redeem the world, the church uh, in Pentecost, and the power that the church had, and the power that the church exerted on the world for good, and then to look at, as I just said, some of the decline of the church's voice and the church's influence in North America. And some of that, you know, some of that we are guilty of, right? I mean, some of the decline has come from big church fights, right? It's come from big disagreements over everything from the right way to baptize somebody 
or the right way to take communion or the right kind of prayers to pray. It's come from disagreements over that, uh, theological things, over human sexuality, of, over other moral uh, uh, and social issues. It's cause, because you know we've declined maybe because there's a sense that some people have that a church is just really insider clubbiness, right? You're either part of the club, insider or an outsider. Maybe that's led to the decline or that, it, that Christians and the church is just a judgmental, scolding uh, bunch of, of folks um, instead of people who are supposed to uh, live differently and, and, and be energized by the Holy Spirit. But I think that our towns and our cities, I think this, I believe this, and I wouldn't say it if I didn't, that our uh, North American culture has suffered and is suffering because the church, God's creation, God's church, seems to have lost it's dynamite. Does that make sense to anybody else? Say yeah. Or blink your lights <laughs> if you're in your car. Yeah. I, I really believe this, and, 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 it, and it, it pains me, um, and it, um, it makes me sad. And, and again, I'm not being judgmental myself, but I believe that God's church has lost some of its dynamite, some of its dunamis, some of that power that God wants bestowed upon God's people, not just individuals. But God's people, that, that explosive power of, of God's Holy Spirit leading the church and guiding the church and providing for the church and energizing the church and moving the church to take risks. Once upon a time, this is what God's people were very well known for is taking risks. Raise your hand if you knew that. Did you know that? Look back in the book of Acts and look at what those disciples were doing, those apostles. Look at the risk those men and women took. Once upon a time, God's church took risks for God in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, the risen Lord. They did that because they had dynamite, because they had power. So, as I said, that grieves me. But hey, we're not staying there. You know, that's naming the situation, but... Remember, especially if you've hung into Grandview uh, a, long, uh, a long time and, and with me, you know that we turn a corner on this. And so that might be my opinion of the current state of things with the church and culture in North America, that we've lost our dunamis, our dynamite, Holy Spirit power. But let us never forget that the church belongs to God. And God designed the church, meaning the people, the male and female followers of Jesus. God designed and intended the church, to be used by God for God's mission, for God's mission to redeem and save the whole world. And by the way, God's mission to redeem and save the whole world, make sure you really get this, okay? It's not just about individual salvation and redemption. When I say God's plan is to use the church to redeem the world, that means the whole world. That means, that means what we think of as nature. That means what we think of as human activities. That means what we think of as all the, the structures and all the things that are part of our world. God designed the church to be part of God's mission, to be used for God's mission to save and redeem the whole creation. That's the goal, right? And God continues to need people to be open and receptive to this Holy Spirit, not just preachers, not just singers, not just a few Sunday school teachers. Folks, it's, it's all of us that dare to claim that name and take the name Christian. Is that, is that God needs us to be open and receptive to the Holy Spirit so we can live differently in the midst of this broken, evil culture around us so that we can live boldly, so that we can live fearlessly, and be more holy as Jesus is holy. See, here's part of where the hope is. Is that even though I've named, because I study this kind of stuff, in my opinion that, that, that there's a, been a decline in the church's influence, and the decline in the church's voice in North America. Some scholars say that the last time that the church, specifically the Protestant church, had any power and any voice and influence in North America was leading up to prohibition. And after Prohibition, because we know that didn't work out so well, amen? The church's voice and influence began to decline, all right? But here's the grace, and here's the good news. The one thing that every church, all churches still are in business to do is personal transformation. Think about that. See, the church is still in the personal transformation business. And if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, you just said it's not about individuals. Well, hold on, I'll get there. The church is still in the, in the uh, uh, personal transformation business. This is why we do what we do. 
That's why we do things like here at Grandview. It's why we worship. It's why we have intentional faith development for the littlest of our kids to the oldest of our members and attenders and those that aren't yet members here. It's why we strive for excellence in all we do. It's all directed towards transformation, right? And, and this, this part of God's work has never gone away. And this is where I turn this next corner and say it's time for a resurgence of this. It is time for a resurgence of this because you see when individual people are transformed by God's Holy Spirit, we can't do that ourselves. When individual people begin to change, when they begin to feel some of that dynamite Holy Spirit power, those individuals are attached to a Christian community. And the Christian community made up of people that are being transformed by the Holy Spirit uh, as part of God's mission to save and redeem the world, they become uh, a church. They become a Christian community uh, that has even more powerful and dynamic Holy Spirit power to be used by God to transform the world. You know, I'm just going to end by pointing back at Peter. If you want an example of how it works, if you want a way to more uh, deeply understand transformation and what that means, look at Peter, right? Before Pentecost happened, Peter couldn't even stand up for his faith, right? When, when people ask him on the night of Jesus' arrest, are you one of him with Jesus? Are you, aren't you one of his people? No, 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 no. Before Pentecost, people couldn't even stand up for his faith. After Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit power of Pentecost of the, was poured out on Peter, he stood up and he boldly preached and he took that risk and he kept taking risks. But on the day of Pentecost, with that kind of fuel, with that kind of power, 3,000 people, 3,000 Jewish people were converted started following the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus. Je Peter's that example of transformation. God's Holy Spirit changed him. And he moved from, he was transformed, Peter, from cowardly to courageous. He was transformed from being scared to being fearless. And it continued with him his whole life. It transformed him from denying Jesus to defending Jesus and, and to declaring him to be Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the risen Lord, the Messiah, right? So here's where I want to end to that. Whether you're watching at home or whether you're, you're, you're watching it later on, we know some people do that, right? No matter where you are, are physically today, but more importantly, no matter where you are mentally or emotionally or spiritually, after three months of dramatic change, after three months of constant information overload that we're just not sure what to believe on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Mask, no mask. On surface, not on surface, right? It's just every day. After three months of this, my prayer is that Peter's transformation inspires you and encourages you. Not just in regards to your fears of a virus, but I mean your, your fears in regards to anything that's holding you back and keeping you from living, fully living the life God wants you to live, right? It's that Peter's transformation, may it inspire and encourage you. You know, I, I uh, have seldom ever done this, but I'm going to do it right now because I feel like God's Spirit told me to. You know, when we talk about transformation and what, what being open to that and how God might use you going forward, you know, I just wonder, I just wonder if out of all this three months and out of all this stuff we've all been through, I wonder how many people might be more open and receptive to a call from God to go into ministry, right? Just think about that and consider that. And if that's you, come talk to me, all right? Because I know a little bit about the process, okay? I just wonder. And so I'll say it again. I'm going to repeat myself no matter where you're at today, no matter where you are mentally, emotionally, spiritually, after everything. In regards to any of the fears that might be holding you back and keeping you from living as God wants you to live, and in regards to your faith, and in regards to your ability to proclaim Jesus using words if necessary, my prayer for everybody, for me, for this church, if you're watching and you're part of another church, for your church, my prayers are for, for resurgence. And let me be crystal clear. I don't mean resurgence, not just simply going back to the activities we used to do. I mean this. 
My prayers and my hopes for weeks now building up to this is a resurgence of Holy Spirit power in this church and in more churches so we can, so we can be on fire for God and help change and redeem the world. Amen? Amen. A resurgence in the Holy Spirit power in the lives of the followers of Jesus. And I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you out there watching, and I'm talking to people that maybe haven't ever experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit. So in that regard, I'm praying for a first surge, a first surge for those who have never experienced God's presence and the Holy Spirit power of God. My prayers, and I hope you will join me in these prayers is that you'll be continuing to pray for God's Holy Spirit to come through and to break through and to get through and to energize us and lift us up and protect us and provide for us. May God make that so. Let's pray about that, please. Lord God, remind us that you're still in control. Remind us, Lord, that in this broken, chaotic world, you allow things to happen. Remind us, Lord God, that we don't always make the best choices and decisions, all of your people. But I pray, Lord God, for this Holy Spirit resurgence. I pray it for everybody. I pray it especially, Lord God, for those that are feeling down and out, and wondering what's next, what's happening in this world, what's happening in this country. I pray especially for a surge or a resurgence of your Holy Spirit to lead and to guide and to heal and to assure and to replace fear with faith, to to replace dread with hope. Lord, you can make it happen, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you do. I pray, Lord God, that today as we further prepare our heads and hearts to be in communion with you and with others, I pray, Lord, that you hear us as we confess our sins and apologize for trespassing. Hear us as we pray in silence. Lord God, now give us that sense of assurance that our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. The slate is wiped clean. And as forgiven people, Lord God, I pray again that there be an opening, a susceptibility to the movement of your Holy Spirit. I pray this for all of us. I pray it in Jesus' name. And in his name, we all join our voices together, praying the prayer out loud in one voice, the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.